teams foster their enthusiasm and connection with each other by increasing their relational and com cultural competency skills. Melissa holds an MS in Community Mental Health Counseling from University of Wyoming and a BA in Business Administration with an emphasis in Entrepreneurship and a BA in French Language from the University of Oregon. Matthew Frey is a writer and a relationship coach whose first book, This is How Your Marriage Ends, but a hopeful approach to saving relationships is slated for a March 22nd release. Matthew's blog, Must Be This Tall to Ride, is a self-reflective personal growth journey which explores his 2013 divorce and documents his journey from sad divorced guy who didn't get to whatever he is today. His mission is to help people, particularly men, recognize trust eroding, relationship poisoning behavior patterns and blind spots in their lives to reduce instances of unwanted divorce and toxic relationships. His work has been featured in New York Times, the Sunday Times, uh, NPR, BBC Radio, and on air with Ryan Seacrest, as well as other several podcasts and in online publications. So um, everyone, uh, please give a warm welcome to Melissa Ryan and Matthew Frey. Um, let's start first. So, um, you know, in terms of your work, uh, Melissa, let's start with you. Um, what do you normally see in terms of these interaction of the micro interactions and dynamics? Melissa, I think you're on mute. <laughs> I was following the rules, Astrid. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. Just joking. Uh, so yes, I've spent most of my time as a counselor, as Astrid outlined. So I'll speaking more to that because the transition, I haven't spent as much time um, working directly with leaders and teams. And what I've seen time and time again uh, is and you know, my mentor Terry Real speaks to this as well. Uh, most most of the couples I see, whether they're um, heterosexual couples or um, you know, follow a different another continuum, uh, you know, or, or gay or what, whatever they're identifying. Whoever's the more relational person is the person dragging the other person into counseling. Um, time and time again. The person that's carrying more of the emotional labor, the person that's um, really tending to the health of the relationship, they're the ones that are dissatisfied usually with how things are because in a patriarchal culture and patriarchy impacts most of the world. Um, so, you know, I've benefited from being in consultation groups with Terry Grill and having counselors from around the world. And we all see the same dynamic of the person bringing the other person in and the less relational person because of power um, and privileged obliviousness is just not even aware that the way the micro interactions they have with their loved one um, are damaging and toxic and not how <sighs> how you would relate to somebody that you say you love. And so, and often they're not very dissatisfied with the relationship. They might have one area like commonly, uh, you know, in a heterosexual relationship, men might say, well, I want more sex or, you know, I wish you wouldn't nag me, these kinds of things. And so in traditional couples counseling, um, we have, were taught not to take sides, so to speak, to be like, okay, his complaint about her nagging is as um, as valid, as important as her dissatisfaction with the lack of connection, the lack of intimacy. And um, over the last several years in training, mostly with Terry Real, I've come to realize, like, no, that's not the same. <laughs> and this is a this issue of. Um, people not recognizing the the impact they have in relationships and the damage they're causing really wreaks havoc outside the marriage like you know these same people that are being dragged into couples counseling you know work have co-workers often are in um i've worked a lot with business owners and couples that have been in business together and that same dynamic of them dismissing um the more relational people in their lives continues to play out. Um, and so 
I, I mean, why I've, one of the reasons I'm transitioning into business is I want to have greater impact. I want to, I want to help more people see this and then bring those relational skills home. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Matthew, how about you? What did, what do you see in your work? Well, I was going to start by saying that I got divorced in 2013 and in my nine year marriage, 12, 13 year relationship, I was the guy, metaphorically speaking, being drug, you know, to counseling. We really didn't do that very much. But but I'm I'm like I'm the villain in Melissa's story. Um, I, I really was. And my wife was the more relational person. And I just was sort of like an obstacle all along the way. And then Melissa also talked about this notion of like not being aware of the harm that's being caused either to the to the person sort of emotionally speaking or to like the integrity of the relationship itself and the work i've done since the divorce and it's been again 2013 so it's been like eight and a half nine years now where um i really went to work on trying to understand how i contributed to the marriage failure and uh it was a selfish exercise at first because i was scared of this happening again and then what i discovered along the way was a total revelation to me and I felt like I learned something really, really valuable about how we need to show up in the world in order to not accidentally poison our most important relationships. And so now this work I do today, writing and talking a little bit and then working one-on-one -on -one with coaching clients is about just sort of like one person at a time or so trying to help them understand at minimum how I came from like not believing I was causing any harm in a relationship to now sort of trying to accept radical personal responsibility for it. And um, I do, I believe very strongly in this idea that we destroy love and trust in our blind spots, that we don't calculate harms being caused. So we sort of deny it. And it is in those sort of interactions that we poison our relationships over time, over five years, 10 years, 15 years. And I don't want people to do that because most of the people would do better if they, I think, came to understand what I believe I've come to understand, at least the so-called like villain in these relationships, the people who are accidentally causing the most harm. And as Melissa and um, Astrid are talking about, it tends to be this person with the most power and the person with the, the fewest relational skills. Okay, great. Thank you. So I, I think that's an interesting point here, right? So we're seeing microdynamics, little everyday examples. I kind of want to take it into the big picture again. How do we find these patterns, right? So in terms of the larger dynamics, now that you all have had, you know, decades of experience, either personally or professionally or both, um, what are you seeing in terms of the larger dynamics at play? Like, what is the pattern here that we're seeing? Can you speak a little bit about that? Do you want to go first, Melissa? Yeah, I can go first. So, you know, there's a saying um, that I've shared with you both when we were talking about this uh, conversation, which comes from family therapy. And the saying is, um, if you really want to know what's going on in a family, you ask the person with the least amount of power. And I uh, would say, if you want to know what's really going on in a community, in a culture, in a country, you ask the people with the least amount of power. Uh, because they have to, out of necessity, out of survival, navigate these systems to be able to have any chance of um, getting access to resources, you know, pursuing whatever um, career they want, et cetera, et cetera. And so they, they learn how the things that... Uh, are hard to see often, right? These these micro dynamics that we're speaking to, um, that we kind of touched on, but didn't give any specific examples. And it, you know, I have so many. One that came to mind when I was reflecting is, I had um, a woman come and say, my husband signed up for a series of mountain bike races, and he didn't ask me at all if that was going to work. He didn't really look at the calendar. He just set up like you know, a little invite on Outlook. And it said, you know, these races are every Saturday from, you know, whatever, if they're like at least a half a day and just programmed it in the calendar. And she's like, he didn't talk to me. And I'm just supposed to deal with the fact that we have two kids and multiple commitments. Like how am, I can't be in two places at once. Mm -hmm. And when I talked to him about it, he was like, well, you know, this is part of my self-care. 
<laughs> okay, so that's one of, I could give thousands of examples where I don't think this husband is intentionally trying to burden the wife, but there is this element of men have been able to participate in family at their discretion, whereas women, it's just an accepted responsibility. And that's whether it's a coupleship or we're talking extended family, like there is an expectation that if you are relational, if you are identifying as you know, taking on more of that archetypal feminine role, whatever you identify as your gender, you're expected to participate. If you're more relational, you're expected to participate relationally and just carry those responsibilities. And so we see this in a macro level when, um, you know, recent social justice movements have come to the surface. Um, and these aren't recent problems. They've been going on in this country since, you know, before its founding. Uh, they've been hu human issues, I mean, since there have been civilization. And, uh, and the, you know, it's so clear to the people that are being impacted that this is an issue, but it takes it, harm being done, like, George Floyd's video, like we had to have actual video evidence for people to be like, oh, I guess racism is still a problem. And yet you've had many activists. I mean, there have been marches uh, going on since, you know, even before MLK's time. I mean, that's when it became much more notable, right? And we have a national backing. But there, this issue has been present. The people who are daily impacted have been like, this is really an issue. It really comes up and um, it takes really big events like these uh, George Floyd and Ahmad Arbery, be, them being recorded for people to see the issue. And that's what's so frustrating in the counseling room, I'm sure with Matthew's clients, is women are like, I've been telling my husband for the last decade that this is an issue, but it's only until I tell him I'm divorcing him that he's willing to come into counseling and he's willing to have a conversation or at work, I've been telling my boss, this is an issue and, you know, and he's ignoring it. He's ignoring it. And now we're in a lawsuit. This happened with my partner's former employer. Now we're in a lawsuit because one of the women is uh, not putting up with the harassment anymore and she got a better job and now she's suing the company for the harassment from the CEO. Like it takes such extreme situations for those in power to see what is so clear to so many others. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, you know, one of the things we keep hearing is, you know, Black women have known about this inequality, right? Um, they've been talking about this. They've been they've been trying to lead this, you know, this initiative, right, for decades upon, I mean, centuries at this point, right? So they're very visible. And it, it also made me realize that how much of a privilege it is to not have to know that because it's not, it's brain space basically, right? It's brain space that you don't have to dedicate to, to knowing how to navigate the world safely. Um, and it's such a disservice, especially when you have to learn these things very early on because it's it's a time for you to actually be able to explore to grow but how can you grow if you already have to deal with all of these constraints and have to know them um, as part of being alive essentially yeah no i i think yeah yeah very good point there melissa um so matthew i do want to ask you about kind of your life coach work right so what what patterns do you see you know when you hear the first few minutes of a counseling session or something like that where what what are the patterns like what is the most common thing that you see it's always uh it's always a version of the same story that i feel i lived mm. and and sort of my personal most famous version of this the one that mm -hmm. i'm quote unquote best known for is this viral blog post that i wrote in 2016 called she divorced me because i left dishes by the sink and it was it's a smidge clickbaity but not on purpose um i was really just it's like my affinity for metaphor is like why I liked it. She didn't literally leave because of the dish, but it was such a perfect example, I think, mm -hmm. of the type of interactions we had that over time, over and over again, resulted in her saying, okay, now I have to, I have to leave. Like I can't have this relationship. And so Melissa talked about it. She gave a great example of 
a husband who failed to consider how his wife would be impacted mm-hmm. by something he scheduled or did. And then, you know, puts it on the calendar and then other people suffer for it. So in my work, I focus on just two ideas very specifically. And that's the second one that I focus on this idea of consideration, calculating for how what I do or say impacts my partner. Mm-hmm. When we fail to consider our partners, when we make decisions, some form of pain happens, right? Like somebody feels sad or angry or disrespected or whatever. And then that person in right, and it's usually the more relational of the, it's the, the person not in power most mm-hmm. often in the context of power dynamics in the relationship. So in my marriage, it was my wife and she would come to me and she would try to tell me that something's wrong. And then so begins what I think is like the most critical micro interaction couples have that destroys trust. And in heterosexual relationships, men are, I mean, I'm just, if we're going to be intellectually honest about it, men are almost always the culprits of doing this. And, and it's, it's validation or the absence of it, I should say. And so in my coaching work, like the number one thing I'm focused on to start with, if a guy's coming to the table with virtually no relational skills is, can you develop a mindful habit of validation and then try truly understand why it's like important. And so what that looks like in my life if we have time to talk about it is my wife would like come to me and say, it could be the dish by the sink, could be anything and say, Matt, you know, something's wrong. You did something or something happened and it hurts me. Mm-hmm. And I would default to like this invalidating response, three different versions of it. Anytime I disagreed or didn't understand where she was coming from. And so she would say, Matt, something's wrong. I feel bad about it. And the first way in which I would invalidate my wife would be to say, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for you to feel hurt by that because it didn't happen the way you said it did. Like maybe she described like something that happened at a party earlier that night. Mm -hmm. And I would disagree that the thing happened. I would, I would suggest that she'd misinterpreted what had actually gone on. And the math result is that her feelings are invalid. Her feelings are wrong because they're based on like some assumption that isn't true. The second version is her feelings are unfair or out of scope with reality. So I would agree that the incident happened. So like, Matt, this thing happened and it hurt me. And I would say, okay, that happened, but why are you making such a big deal out of it? Like a a normal or a fair or uh, appropriate response to like this situation would be to, you know, think and feel the way I do. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows it's a super dick thing to say. And then the third way I think that we habitually invalidate people is we just defend ourselves. My wife would say, hey, Matt, you did this thing. It hurt me. And I would feel I was like justified. I would feel it was the, the right thing to do. And I would go to great lengths to try to convince her of it and defend myself and explain why. And the amount of trust that we erode is not hugely significant in each of these conversations, which is, I think, the really scary part of it. I think that these are like sort of like micro trust erosion incidents that pile up over 5, 10, 15 years. And sooner or later, the person on the invalidation end of these conversation patterns says, every single time my partner doesn't agree that I should think or feel the thing I think or feel, I'm left to be told that I'm crazy or that I'm weak or that he or she won't show up for me in this relationship. And I think a person with healthy personal boundaries chooses to eventually leave that relationship. And that ended up being my wife, um, you know, eight or nine years ago. And at the time I thought I was this victim of this, you know, unfair person blaming me for everything. And the work has been coming to understand how I unwittingly participated in driving a healthy person Mm -hmm. away. And she made a good choice. Yeah, in a way, when you disagree and when you invalidate, right, what that means is you're putting on even more work for the other person to then make their case. Like, you're not coming in from a sense of curiosity of like, okay, like, does she have any truth to this? Or is what she's saying making sense and everything? You're basically asking her to to prove it to you that what your you know that your position is wrong you're you're not doing any of that work she's the one who's having to do it and it's interesting that you say that because it's very similar to um and i'm going to make a plug for picture a scientist which is this documentary on netflix um it's absolutely amazing it chronicles three women's experience with regards to power dynamics and discrimination and one of them was an mit professor who had to go around and measure out the the square footage of each lab to determine the fact that the male right footage for uh, for their labs are actually much bigger than women's 
why couldn't that be a guy's thing, right? Like, why couldn't the a male professor decide to do that, right? So the person who has to demonstrate that inequality is the person that's without power. So it's it's putting on that level of responsibility as well. And can I ask a question of Matt? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. This is a fireside chat. So. Yeah, Matt, I'm curious because I, I believe I read this on your blog that you identified as like a nice guy. So I'm yeah. curious how much the feedback from your wife really, uh, you know, went up against your perception of yourself and what helped you start to expand um, you're like, be able to accept like, yes, I may be a nice person, but that didn't align. My actions didn't align with wh who I'm trying to be. You know, I'm curious about that. Oh, I'm really glad you asked that. Um, it was, um, in this book, I don't want to forgive me. I don't want to be book plug person, but my, it was, it was my editor's number one takeaway from the book was that idea that good people can be bad spouses. And I, I, I didn't, Right, I didn't know how to think like that. I thought I'm like well liked by friends and coworkers, and I've had successful relationships with every single person. I mean, we're going to talk about data points today. I had good relationships with 100% of humans in my life, at least you know it's hyperbole, but like that was my perception. And then the person that like I sacrificed the most for, and loved the most, and had a child with, and shared all of my resources with, and promised the rest of my life to, is the only human suggesting that I'm not this like decent guy that everybody else seems to say I am. And so that came right in direct conflict. I, I had a lot of work to do to figure out that it doesn't, it's not relevant how well intentioned I am. It's not relevant how philosophically I desire to do good in the world or to love my wife or anyone. The math result of my actions can equal harm regardless of my intentions. And that is a significant blind spot in my experience with like the guys that I'm working with. We just fail. If you're a good person, you're automatically a good spouse is this default assumption. And we should be given the benefit of the doubt because of it. And so, sorry, wife who's hurt right now, you know, don't, don't bother me with your inconvenient emotions because I'm a good person is sort of the way we respond to actual pain and actual um, bids for connection and help. I, the way I like to say it today is my wife tried to recruit me to cooperate with her to eliminate like bad, painful things that were happening to her. And then the whole time I was implying that she was like dumb or crazy or weak for, you know, like asking, like for complaining about this in the first place. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how closely that aligns with everybody's experiences, but I bet it's close. Yes. And you're hitting on, you know, what your wife um, is bidding for is she's experienced a rupture in their relationship. Um, and this research comes from Edtronic. And actually there was a, I feel shitty about this, but there was a female scientist that actually originated the attachment research, but it's Edtronic that gets credit for it. Not surprised oh, there. <laughs> um, he gave credit in this talk that I heard, and I wish I had gone and looked up her name, uh, but I have not yet. So, uh, but Edtronic's research, we'll just give him credit at the moment, uh, on attachment is that there's this process of rupture and then repair. And between rupture and repair, it, there's an element of disharmony. And um, Stan Tatkin has since applied this cycle, which originally was between parent and child, to intimate partnerships. That couples have a rupture, they experience disharmony, and then, you know, based on Gottman's work, if you're good at repair, right, you will, you'll stay together. And if you suck at repair, you won't. Um, and the challenge is, is so many men will not recognize, so many people in power will not recognize the rupture in the first place. That's what you just gave examples of like, you're, you're, you're saying, nope, you're overreacting or yeah, but it's not really a rupture. And so repair can't even happen. Right. And what she's seeking and what builds trust. And that's what this research has demonstrated is the repair process. Like it's actually the going from rupture to repair that makes you feel 
more trusting of a person. If you think of any friend, coworker, or any relationship where you had a conflict, and so there was a rupture in your connection, and they you had you received really good feedback from them, you talked it out, you feel closer to them as a result of going through that process than if you had never gone through the process in the first place. Mm-hmm. So and so intimacy is, go ahead, built, intimacy is actually built with successful repair. So if you've actually never really had, you know, these moments of disagreement or anything, like it's not really even that deep to begin with. It's it's that level of repair that helps to build intimacy. Yes. And so, um, you know, she's seeking that. And we are wired at the beginning. If you watch the still face experiment and it's with one year olds and caregivers and they've done it, they started with moms, but they've expanded it to um, other parents, dads, and other parents. And it's the the same results of the kids interacting and, you know, they, they miss the connection, but they, you know, the mom coos or the dad coos and, and the baby coos, and you can tell they're in harmony. Right. And then there's Mm -hmm. some sort of rupture in the still face experiment. The parent is told to just not emotionally respond. And you see, oh, it's so heartbreaking to watch, but you see the little kid, the little one-year-old, try to get the parent to re-engage. They'll, they're trying everything. They're batting their eyes. They're making the sounds. And eventually what happens is the the kid will like hit themselves. They like, they look away. It causes them tremendous. It's This is why I find it really painful to watch. It causes them tremendous distress. And what this research has shown is we feel that that interaction, that way of responding and then feeling like, you know, somebody's not trying to repair with us, just like that baby, that doesn't go away. It's wired in our nervous system. Mm-hmm. And so there's, there's not only the pain that the, what, you know, your wife was feeling, right? She's like, Hey, I'm, why aren't we getting back in sync? Why aren't we getting back in harmony and that pain that she's feeling? But then there's the confusion. If we all, if most of us, not all of us, because some of us, um, unfortunately do not have strong attachment, but a good majority of us have, you know, a, you know, good enough attachment. What happens? What is it that people in power lose that they had when they were little? when they were babies, when they understood this cycle of repair, rupture and repair that was Mm -hmm. wired into them. What keeps them once they're an adult from recognizing, oh, this person I love is in distress Mm -hmm. or this person that's important to me is in distress. How can I come back into harmony with them? Yeah. And I mean, in terms of the macro level as well, right? Like how, I mean, I'm even just making the connection of like, if we did this on a professional level in the workplace, right? Someone has an issue at work and they're being invalidated as well. And then I'm even looking at it on a societal level. Like what level of, is it empathy? Like, is it, what, what level of something did we lose as, as children, as we were growing up to a point where we can't we don't acknowledge racism right like we make other people prove it to us that racism exists or any type of other ism exists it's it's interesting to me like these dynamics these kind of personal interaction dynamics play out in society um do you i mean is that just because it's done on a collective level or what do you think about that melissa um so going with, you know, the research and and the training I've received, you know, I believe that patriarchy has more to gain um, from people disconnecting from their hearts, Mm. right? So the system itself works that way. Yes. The system goes, like, is more, I would say, tougher and more ruthless on those that are going to uphold the system, right? Those in power, right? So most commonly, I would say that's white cis male men. And so the system starts so young with getting them to disconnect from their hearts. And some, and there's, it's not black and white. It's so, um, it's so nuanced and it impacts men differently, right? Because they have different friends and they might have parents that are a little more relational. So it's not as dramatic, but I think I shared this example with you, Astrid, that <laughs> really depressed me. I had this couple, one of my favorite couples I've ever worked with. Um, and they're still, we're dealing with relational issues. And actually one of the things that made it so challenging is the husband 
saw himself as a nice guy, but he also saw himself as a progressive, like I know about these isms sort of fellas. And, and it really tender hearted, so involved in his kids, all these things, but he was still unintentionally because of privilege obliviousness causing his wife harm. And they brought in their adolescent son to see me during one session because he was really struggling. That didn't really go well because he, here they, they're like, here, see our marriage counselor. And, you know, he's this adolescent boy who's, per, you know, um, wants to, has this image and he doesn't want to open up to me. And, you know, we, we try to have a conversation, just him and I, and then they come in and, you know, his dad asked him, like, I don't, you know, I know that you're struggling. Like, why, why, why is it so hard for you to open up? Like, I don't believe I ever taught you that men don't cry or that men can't connect with their emotions. And he's like, no, I had to learn it from my friends. Mm. And I was like, oh shit, (laughs) this issue is just, yeah. So even if you try to do this at home or something like that, it's, it's it's the societal effect on it that you have to think about as well. Mm-hmm. And so that's just one example of like, it's just, and, and it's, you it's, um, and in some cultures, it's worse than other cultures, right? Like, and my experience in Terry Rill's group is that with these counselors from, from, I believe all, all continents, except Antarctica, uh, th- they were talking about these same dynamics, these same power dynamics. Um, yeah. Well, Antarctica doesn't know. have those things because it's mostly populated by penguins. No. <laughs> yeah. But actually, in picture of scientists, right, where that yeah. uh, female scientist was bullied was in yeah. Antarctica. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think that's, it's really interesting to see, again, like how these power dynamics come into play on a micro level. And then really it, it negates the the most marginalized aspects of society, right, on a societal level. Um, we ignore, we ignore black women, we ignore people of, you know, of various different racial backgrounds, right? That's not basically a cis white male. And we make them do kind of this work, right? And we also kind of negate them. We basically say this isn't valid. Like what you're seeing isn't even true at all. Um, so I guess my next question is, why is it so important? Like, why, why are we doing this talk? Like, why, why do we need to tell women that what they're seeing is, is true and real? What do you, you think want me about to go first? Or <laughs> Matthew has a talk Matthew, for a minute. You wanna, what what would be the yeah, what would be the message? Like why do women need to hear about this, this power and gender dynamics? What do you think? I'm so sorry, is that for me, Astrid? I didn't catch that. Either one of you. Okay, well, I'll I'll I mean, I'll take a stab at it from my perspective, and uh, it's possible both of you will have a different take on it, but it is my belief that the quality of our interpersonal relationships is the number one like influencer of like the quality of our lives. I, I don't think anything affects us more profoundly than just the health of, you know, our closest relationships. And it starts with, it tends to start with, you know, like the nuclear family, whether that's, you know, we're kids with our parents or whether that's we're adults in a romantic partnership who may or may not have children as well. And then the next ring out, right, is like extended family and friends and coworkers and things like that. And when we, the thing that I believe that I've taken away from this work after the last eight or nine years, and again, this might seem ridiculous to people who have been pretty good at like relational skills their entire lives, like hearing me talk about this as this like new revelation, but it extends to everything. Like every, all the work in my that, that I've thought about and that I've done in the context of romantic relationships, a great majority of it applies to parenting dynamics with children. Mm-hmm. It applies to a boss subordinate relationship at work or even just two coworkers. Um, it applies to, to damn near every human relationship that I've encountered. And I feel strongly that I am better equipped at relating in a healthy way with somebody else. Mm-hmm. because of this so for me it's just like that simple it's like your most important relationship is is the one at home whatever sort of lifestyle you choose the people who you spend the most time with share resources share homes and space with they're the ones where that relationship has to mm-hmm. it has to be a healthy one or your life's going to suffer tremendously for it 
is the way that I think about it. That's why I think it's important. I think the trickle down effects of bad relationships is a significant problem sort of societally, in addition to just how bad it makes us feel and affects our health and things like that. Absolutely. Melissa, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I, and I think the other piece that's so important, and I would include myself in this, is um, if we don't know these dynamics, we could just think we're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And we'll just keep, I, I, I see this a lot um, with my more uh, relational I mean, because this comes up in same sex relationships, whoever's the more relational person is like, I've read books, I've read podcasts, I've tried to get us to do these worksheets, I've, I, I've done all these things, right? Or um, my friend was really pissed when she was working for this organization that was mostly 60 plus white cis male, it was all who was in power. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they the the executives are like, oh, we're getting all these you know, these, these situations where these women are feeling like they can't um, share what they're thinking, they can't be creative. So we should create a group to help them find their voice. <laughs> it's like, my friend was like, or maybe we should get these men to figure out ways to make it in a, a in welcoming, inclusive environment so the women feel empowered to share their voice. Instead of putting it, the onus on women to um be more confident to 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 put themselves out there um one of the resources that i shared was a podcast uh, with the women who wrote uh the article the, the title is like stop saying women have imposter syndrome mm -hmm. and it's talking about you really need to look at the um the context of the environment women and other underrepresented groups are finding themselves in and is it them that has this like disorder or is the culture sick and they're the ones that are most impacted by the issues in the culture and so it doesn't mean they have the issue it's like well of course like they're nervous about putting their voice out there because it's not psychologically safe right so that's why my friend was upset is it wasn't about how the executives could create more psychological safety so the women and underrepresented folks could feel comfortable to put themselves out there. It's like, oh, well, they have the issue. Um, you know, I, th this might feel crass, but I feel like it's the issue of he who smelt it dealt it. And it's like, no, just because I'm saying it smells around here does not mean it was my issue, you know, <laughs> like, and that's, that's really the, the problem we're facing is um, one of the issues is not only what Matt's saying about quality of life or Matthew, sorry, sorry, Matt. Matthew's saying about, uh, you know, quality of life, but it's also like this burden keeps being put on those, like you already previously stated, Astrid, those that um, are being most impacted in a negative way by the system. Mm -hmm. And women just keep, and other um, groups keep being like, oh, I just got to figure out a way to, to, to troubleshoot. If I just have more confident, if I can put my boundaries out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's just so much more work and not as great ROI, right? Like if we could get those in power to change their behaviors, that would have just a, such a tremendous impact. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think there's that piece of we're having this conversation. So women and underrepresented groups could, recognize like it's not you it's them really <laughs> like you know there's that 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 you know the saying in relationship oh it's 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 not you it's me it's mm -hmm. like well no it really is you <laughs> like <laughs> you know yeah. this really is you dude in my relationship with me or you dude supervisor at work or you know the some of the worst offenders are those are sometimes women in power. And a big issue around that mm -hmm. is in order to get to these positions of power, we often have to take, and this goes into your versatility question. I don't know if I'm skipping ahead, but you know, we often have to take on more masculine ways of doing leadership, right? So, you know, how we came up with this title of relational versatility is this idea, how can you adapt to situations and read mm -hmm. a situation and determine, is it psychologically safe to put myself out there? Because if it's not, I shouldn't expend that energy. 
because it's going to cause me harm, right? So I got to, I got to evaluate um, the situation and be versatile um, and be able to shift from the archetypal masculine leadership qualities. So we're not talking about male, female, but just archetypes, masculine and archetypal feminine. And so archetypal masculine leadership is, you know, linear, directive, uh, action oriented. That's really helpful. Feminine leadership is collaborative. It's reflective. It's uh, very process relationship oriented. And being versatile is being able to shift between relationship and task. If you have too much relationship, you're not going to get shit done. If you have too much task, you're not going to get the alignment you need because people aren't going to feel a part of the team. That that feminine leadership is about building the team element. And so versatility is the ability to shift between these characteristics, which are all human characteristics. Wow, that was great. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to segue to that. And I want to delve a little bit deeper in terms of what you've experienced. Um, and, and we can move between, uh, let's go to Matthew on this. Matthew, what do you think it, when you see these issues and these power dynamics at play, what would be the versatility skills that women in heterosexual relationships need to kind of maybe exercise that they may, you know, not have done so traditionally in the past in order for them to kind of get maybe the outcome that they need? I'm going to first like sort of raise my hand and talk about a healthy level of discomfort with even trying to advise women on what they should be doing mm -hmm. in relationships with the dynamics of the one my wife suffered through. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't feel like a super cool thing to be doing. But it, it, and, you know, there's a couple, I, again, and forgive me for being so hyper-focused on romantic relationships, but it's my world. And what I see happening with particularly young people or, or at least people in the early stages of relationships is frequently, and, and again, I, I hate to talk about it so like heteronormatively, but it's like, like in guy-girl relationship, right? It's, um, and it mirrors so closely like my college experience. It is, it, it's when the conflict patterns first emerge, right? Like early in the relationship is when perhaps the female partner in the, and the heterosexual relationship says, hey, this bothers me or this bothers me or I don't like this or this hurts my feelings. And I wish young women in this situation, young people in this situation would identify, they don't know that that exact thing that hurts will destroy trust and intimacy in year like six, seven, eight beyond of the relationship. I, I don't know if, if there's a belief that it will get outgrown. I don't know if it's this really strong desire to be in a relationship or to get married or to start a family or what it is, and young people particularly, but people compromise their values. People fail to enforce strong boundaries. And I don't know, I don't pretend to know where that fear comes from. Mm -hmm. I suppose like fear of loss, you know, the whole like sunken cost fallacy, um, you know, maybe it's that. But if people knew how sort of miserable 30, 35, 40, 45 could be, uh, mm -hmm. putting children through it, certain financial losses, and just all of the fracturing that happens when relationships fall apart after they've been like, you know, intermingled for many, many years. Mm -hmm. I think they'd take more seriously these quote unquote red flag mm -hmm. behaviors early in the relationship. So for me, the answer is not more complicated than defining healthy boundaries and enforcing them. But that mm -hmm. is difficult when you don't necessarily even know what that means. Yeah. Right. And it's, I, you know, and I don't know. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how to help a person define a healthy boundary and then enforce it necessarily. Mm -hmm. These are just things I encourage people to do, but I don't necessarily feel qualified to like give people the, the skills or the tools necessary to do that. Hell, I probably have problems with boundary enforcement in my own life. But anyway, that is something I generically believe women more often than men, at least in my work, mm -hmm. I see suffer the consequences of hopefulness, kindness, forgiveness, I'm not sure what it is, but they like allow these, these things to happen that hurt them mm -hmm. instead of saying it's not okay mm -hmm. for me to feel hurt yeah. over and over again by things you do and then to just have it happen over and over again. I guess I just think the pain's tolerable in year one or two of a relationship and it becomes intolerable to children in 10 years later and then... Right. It's a sad and, story for everyone involved. 
Yeah, no, thank you. And, and Melissa, I do want to ask you also, you know, what are kind of the gender dynamics that are at play with regards to women exercising these types of power? Um, you know, is it, do you find it to be, is it just not acceptable? Like, like, I mean, I think Matthew has a really good point, you know, enforcing boundaries is an important thing, but in your experience, what has been the challenges with regards to that? Well, I just wrote down the movie Reality Bites, which is just one example in the media of, um, some of you might not have seen this, is a movie from the 90s of, uh, you know, Renona, Winona Ryder, Ethan Hawke, they're in this relationship. Ethan Hawke is a total jerk, as, as to be expected, and like dismisses her feelings, you know, there are so many movies like this that make me so upset because what ends up happening, you know, he writes a song about how he's just the worst. And then Winona Ryder is expected to be like, oh, he means he has such a good heart, you know, and she's supposed to take him back. Right. Like, well, he wrote her the song that he's shitty. And so I feel like for me, I believe it's not just a feeling. I believe that social, like our media, the movies, the, the books we read, the magazines we are exposed to around relationships communicate to women that if there is an issue in the relationship, it is their job to fix it. Mm. And like, and so, and, and, and that it's actually romantic, you know, when the man, when Ethan Hawke is like, I am such a shithead, you know, when Nona Ryder's supposed to be like, oh, are you yes and that's why i love you and it's like what no he's treated you like shit if this was a friendship i tell you don't be his friend and so um and even in the picture of the scientist you know it got me i'm getting riled up i can feel it in my body it got me so upset for sure i was like feeling rage when the woman is talking to her friend who was there in antarctica witnessing her getting bullied and he says, well, I just didn't really know it was affecting you. And, and, and she's trying to like, even in this conversation, 20 years later, try to convince him uh, and like explain, um, you know, why it was hard for her to speak up. And I, it's like, well, it's so obvious to <laughs> anyone in the, <laughs> that's relational, why there's an issue, like, right? Like she's one woman. There's three dudes. They're in this back, the back country. There's so much programming that we experience in this culture around um, our safety that can cause issues of like, is it safe even in intimate partnerships? You know, one of the biggest um, groups that pushed for, uh, oh, I just totally spaced on the when we stopped, you know, alcohol in this country, what is that called? Prohibition. <laughs> prohibition. I was like, what is it? The temperance movement? Um, prohibition. A lot of that was women who were sick of getting beat up by their husbands. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like, the, but they had to do it in a like finessed way. Right. So there's like wiring around, is it safe for me to be confrontational, even with the person I love? Mm -hmm. Um there's also this expectation in the culture that women fix issues. If there's issues in the relationship, that responsibility falls to them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think there's just, and when we don't realize that, we don't realize how much that, you know, as Terry Real saying, we are all fish swimming in the sea of patriarchy. And I would add white supremacy. Um, and ableism and all the other things, right? And so we and all of us are taking in those toxins until we realize that the water is poisonous and we create a barrier. Um, so I think in, in response to your question, Astrid, like what can women do? It's first realizing that it's not your fault that it's not working, even though the society has told you that if the relationship's not working, whatever the relationship is, it's on you. Mm -hmm. um, it's more than likely not your fault, or it's a lot less your fault than you're taking on. Cause that's the other piece is yes. Like for sure. Women in my experience with couples, like they could say things nicer, they could be more direct, all these things, but they're doing the best they can with the skills they have and with the harm that they're receiving. Right. So you're mm -hmm. asking this person who's being harmed to be more articulate. It's like when, you know, um, black women have said like, 
we get criticized for being the angry black woman. And it's like, well, of course they're angry. If they know anything about what's going on, if they can recognize how they're being victimized, that's the that's also a big hurdle, I would say, Astrid, I was sharing this with you. If you identify myself, I would put myself in this as like a confident, badass chick that's like, I can do these things. It can be really difficult to realize you've been victimized in any way because that feels shitty because that doesn't make you feel strong. And then it can be especially difficult to realize you have been victimized by somebody you love, somebody that you've invited into your life, mm -hmm. whether they meant to or not. As Matt was saying, most of his clients and most of the clients I've worked with, they're not intentionally trying to cause harm. But they are. Yeah. <laughs> and and what they tend to do is bounce between when they're confronted with this harm, they bounce between grandiosity and toxic shame. And when they're grandiose, they think they're 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 moving the blame, right? They're like, no, you're misperceiving this. It's not the issue. Mm -hmm. They're one up. Mm -hmm. And then when you finally kind of get them to connect with, no, this really is causing harm. They really start to connect with their heart. Well, that doesn't feel comfortable. And so then they go to, I am the very worst person, like Ethan Hawke in the movie. I, you're right. I, I shouldn't even, I don't even deserve to have you. Well, in both those states, whether they're one up or one down, it's still all about them. It's mm -hmm. just a different manifestation. Yeah. And in order for healing to take place, in order for care, um, well, for that repair to take place, in order for connection to take place, you have to be heart to heart. You can't be one up or one down. You've got to be like, yeah, I'm human and I make mistakes and I can, I'm brave enough to hear that I've caused you harm. Great. There are some really good questions here. I, I want to um, interject with one of them because it's kind of also relevant to what we're just discussing here. Um, and it's about, you know, how can discussion of setting boundaries uh, play out in a more formal power structure like at work? What does that mean, especially knowing that, you know, some people don't necessarily have the choice to leave, right? So how can you I guess, create a boundary within a boundary of yourself without actually leaving these toxic environments? Do you want to answer that, Matthew? Or were you, you know, like, <laughs> you're like, no, no, that's you, Melissa. Um, so a big piece, yeah, you I you hit on that, Astrid. First, I would say the internal boundary of like, and this is I offer this up to women who can't leave workplaces or can't leave relationships. Is that's first, it's too. like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's first stop expending all this emotional labor because you're there's no return on investment. You're just you're, it's some cost. You're just like putting so much emotional and mental energy into something you are not getting a return on, which is going to make you usually feel more resentful, but it's just it's taking a toll. So I would say the first piece at a work situation is creating that internal boundary of like, I'm not going to put keep putting out all this energy I've been putting out um, to try to make this better. I'm going to conserve my energy. And it doesn't mean I'm going to be rude and I'm going to like cause more issues for myself, but I'm going to stop um, exerting this energy. And I might have to create some level of, of armor, really, I would say of some level of protection. And depending on how toxic the environment is, you might want like full armor. And I know Brene Brown, she's pushing to de-armor. I would say that's fine as long as the situation's mm. not toxic. If you're in a toxic situation, you do need protection. I would say don't ditch your protection, you know, like, and if you don't have any protection, you build some so that you're not absorbing the toxins in your environment, right? And so creating those inter that internal boundary of like, I'm not going to put my part out there. Um, and, and so that's the first step. I would also consider like, who are going to be your allies in this situation? Because because it can feel so isolating when you're in an environment. So whether that's at work or outside the workplace, like who can you go to and start to assemble that? Because before I'm, I would recommend anyone challenging anything, you want to have, feel that support and connection and that you're not the solo person facing this big problem. Um, so having peer support group, you know, women in science, other associations, whoever is going to help you feel like, well, is going to validate that the shit you're facing is real, um, but also encourage you to show up in these ways. And then I, I, 
I have, I know this is where you wanted to end, but it, it's coming to mind of like some of the people that, that are the hardest to reach are the ones that have the most power. And that's what makes this work so difficult. And so I've been thinking a lot about like, how have I reached like really grandiose men um, in general? <laughs> I've had some grandiose women, but you know, in general, like how have I reached the men that most needed to hear this message? And a lot of times I, I start with like what their values are and then helping them like guide them towards, well, if you did more of this and starting, starting really positive, like if you do more of this, that's going to be in alignment with what you're saying is important. If you're mm -hmm. saying it's important for us to cre create teamwork PI, then when you do these things, and it might only be one thing because they might really suck at creating a good team, like emphasizing that. And then as you they start to shed their armor, then you if you have the capacity, you might start to talk with them about the ways in which they're causing harm. I have found if you start with the ways somebody's causing harm, especially because the people in power are have the most guarded hearts, usually, like, because that's what I was saying about patriarchy is it cuts particularly men away from their hearts. So their hearts are very guarded. And so uh, Terry Riel uses the metaphor of an m, &M hard shell, gooey on the inside. <laughs> so if you can, if you can help them kind of melt that heart's then you can start to talk about the ways in which they're causing harm. But if they're, if their walls are up, it's just going to bounce right off. Cause they're going to be like, that's not in alignment with who I am. Great. Thank you. Um, Matthew, I want to get this to, to reward to you. This was an audience question that was actually submitted before um, this session. Um, and I think this is really good. We've been talking a lot about what people have, you know, who are in the lesser power dynamic, right, can do. So this is the opposite question, which is how can we get men and women in power to recognize and interrupt these toxic behaviors, particularly in the environments that they lead? Do you feel like there's some real hard truths here that we need to, to address to them? How, and then maybe even talk about your own personal journey, right? Like how, what had to happen in order for you to actually receive that level of epiphany for yourself and well, that work? That's the, and I was thinking about it the entire time Melissa was answering, you know, the previous question mm -hmm. is because this is, I, I've not seen this, a, a, a young man raised to be conscientious and practice mindful consideration and to have let's say like emotionally intelligent skills, you know, they tend to be able to navigate all this stuff. But in my experience, that is the vast minority mm -hmm. of, of, of men that I've encountered. Most are just quote unquote guys like me. And what that they, it, we talked about this. It's, it's right. It's this default setting of, to me, it's what privilege looks like, right? It's like, you, you don't know that you're, causing any harm because nothing ever really feels bad to you except people quote unquote complaining about something that you're doing or not doing. Mm -hmm. um, I really believe it has to hurt. Mm. Th that was my experience. And I just, and I don't necessarily know what it looks like in the workplace, but my, I, I suspect it looks like lawsuits. I suspect it looks like losing your best people um, because they're not going to tolerate it anymore. Um, in my life, without question, my wife had to leave and I had to lose half of my son's childhood in order to feel whatever fuel I needed to feel to do this work. And I, it, it's just like a really shameful thing to like admit, but it's absolutely my experience. And it's my experience with virtually every guy I talk to. I talk to a lot of men in positions of power, right? I talk to guys with a lot of financial resources most of the time. And a lot of them are VPs or presidents or founders of various companies. And I don't know to what extent they take what we talk about into their workplace or to what extent they feel like they apply. We, we stay so hyper-focused on what's going on in the home. But um, these guys had to have the pain from right, their wife or their partner or whoever saying we're done or I'm about to leave to even begin to do the work. The way they find me is they Google, you know, stuff about like bad relationships and then some percentage of the time they land on my work. I mean, that's how everyone finds me. 
So something had to hurt bad enough for them to do the work to begin with. And um, I, I don't know, the way that I think about it is I had to hurt emotionally speaking, on like a level commiserate with what my wife experienced in order to truly understand the position I'd inadvertently put her in. I don't want to sound like I'm defending myself, but I, I didn't know until I knew. And I wonder if when people have power, when people have privilege, when people have blind spots to the sufferings of people not like them, if it requires them experiencing some element of quote unquote suffering, in order to have that like empathy experience um it's what happened for me and i, I don't like that that's my answer like I, I i wish i knew what to say i guess i think that my job as a father is to ensure that my son doesn't grow up with the same default setting blind spots right that's like i think the best i have to offer and then to just try to do some meaningful work in the world yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you say that. I have an anecdotal story, too. Um, the woman allowed me to re um, basically talk about this. Uh, she left her lab after being, you know, with her boss, I think, for almost a decade or so, um, because the environment that she found herself in was too toxic. Now, I think it's not just about, oh, you, you just leave and you leave and now your problem is solved. But it's actually about exercising that power when you do have that power. So I kind of keep in mind, like, this level of recognition that as I move up the corporate ladder, right, as I have more power, that I have the ability to push upon the higher ups or whatever it is to try to at least influence them. And if I can't, I, I would leave as well. But I wouldn't just leave just to get rid of the problem for myself. What I would say to them, and this is exactly what this woman said and then sat down with, with her PI and said, I left or I am leaving because I've raised this issue with you and you've ignored me. And now this is part of what you have to do, right? To, to deal with the consequences of you not actually addressing these problems. Now, again, obviously not everybody can leave like that, but I think, I think you're right. I mean, as depressing as it does sound, it sounds like this love, like level of revelation requires a level of just very difficult realization on, on, on behalf of the person who has that privilege of obliviousness. Yeah, I, th I think of it a lot like um, another facet of my work has been working with folks impacted by substance use. And often they have to hit their rock bottom, not anyone else's, right? So other people are like, you've had your third DUI and you just lost your job and like, and it just piles up, but mm -hmm. they're still like in denial. Mm -hmm. And then at some point they hit that rock bottom and no matter how many people have pled, pled with them, right? Like you're really on this bad track and it can be so overwhelming for them to then, you know, climb back up. But it's like, what creates that awareness? What is it that triggers it? Sometimes this, this happens with substance abuse in families. It has to be tough love. And what's shitty is in marriages, a lot of times, like with your wife, Matthew, she doesn't, she also doesn't want to see her son half the time. So she's like, well, this is shitty. Like if I divorce him, like I'm going to continue to have suffering because now I, I'm only going to be able to see my son half time. And this is a real issue that I see with a lot of women. Um, cause I often, you know, it's women who are dragging the men in, uh, or the more relational partner, um, with the same sex couples. And that's, but this, it's the same issue of like, but if I leave or end this relationship, I also have to give up the life that we've co-created. And mm -hmm. that's a big loss for me. And, and, and yet for, for the change to happen, often it is, you know, I just had this conversation. I think I shared it with you guys. And this is a common conversation I had with the woman. Like, this is the systemic issue you're facing. You've tried these other things. It's not working. If you don't want to divorce him, you're going to have to do something that demonstrates how serious the issue is. And so you, often I'm recommending women move out. 
because that's clear enough that there's an issue, right? Uh, like I'm moving out. <laughs> there's th this is a pretty dramatic situation, especially when there's kids involved or pets or whatnot, right? Like that's a pretty significant step and it can create some space um, for potentially it not to end in divorce. It can. And I think this scares a lot of women. They might realize like, oh, life is way easier when I'm not having somebody cause me emotional harm. Like it's easier being by myself, not constantly being rejected, right? Not constantly having somebody rupture this relationship. And then really the term is from my point of view, whether it's, um, intentional or not, it's a form of gaslighting. You're telling somebody that their reality is not their reality. It is not malicious. Often it's not a malicious form of gaslighting, but it is a form of gaslighting. You're telling them your reality is not your reality. And I, this is how I'll show you that it's not real. And so, um, yeah. And then the same with work is, is like you were saying, lawsuits, it's people in power. I, one of the biggest the things that I was most rageful about in that picture of scientists, right, is that young man who was a graduate student. So I understand compared to the man leading the expedition, he has less power, but he's still a man, which means he has more power than his female colleague, even though in terms of seniority, she had more seniority, right? Like she's a full, full cent, a scientist there. Um, but it takes those, those, the bypassers to advocate, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, as well. Um, and so like, what would be so great is if the woman who left her lab, if she also had other colleagues step in and say, yeah, this is true. Right. That's why the Me Too mm -hmm. movement finally had momentum because instead of just one, a few women saying this is happening to me, you had for the first time, I guess, women feeling confident enough or just fed up enough. I'm not really sure to say like, yes, this is happening. This is a systemic issue and having the, you know, the backing. And I think a, per a perk, whether you want to say it's a pandemic perk or not, of the pandemic is like people didn't have a lot of other things going on. So when marches were happening around Black Lives Matter, like it got more attention than it previously had mm -hmm. because of the circumstances we found mm -hmm. ourselves in. Um I don't know. I think I might've gone on a, a tangent. No, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, we've been getting a lot of really good questions. We also had some pre-submitted questions, but I, I do want to go to this one next as well. Um, it seems that there can be a harmful side of relationality or a near mimic of it. So as a non-binary femme, I find cis women often gender police me to be nicer, to make more space for others, often men or people who don't need an advocate, basically telling me to take more on the workplace relationality rather than being direct right? Doing my actual work or being willing to advocate and disagree politely. What would you say is the term for that? And I think I kind of just want to have a discussion, right, about women policing other women in general, especially in the workplace. Yes. Well, I, I mean, that's like also reinforcing patriarchy. Like, that's another example of how we're all impacted by that, right? Like, mm -hmm. so that's, to be nicer, use a nicer tone. I mean, that's just reinforcing the patriarchal system of like, yeah. don't make waves. I mean, this is, again, why I don't think the Me Too move, why the Me Too movement wasn't able to happen until we had an internet, pro, um, plat, until we had the kind of platforms we have now where you could build that kind of momentum and not have women saying, well, like, well, you really shouldn't make waves and you really shouldn't do this. And um, I, I would say some, uh, and this, I was reflecting on this myself. I think some of the worst offenders of these issues are people who perceive themselves as woke. Mm. And that can cause more damage because people start to have trust in them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was, and, and then, and then, they're more willing to be vulnerable. And then it like, there's a, this backlash that happens. Um, and so here they, you know, they open themselves up. They are like, Oh, I'm in a safe environment. Uh, the woman, my memories, shit. Yeah. These days. <laughs> Cause I have a baby as you, as you know, but, um, the, the, the women from the podcast with Brene Brown that wrote their article, mm -hmm. you know, she talked about how when she's brought in, to do this like activism work around um, 
diversity, inclusion, and equity, and everyone's being so nice. Uh, she used this term pet to, or this phrase pet to threat. So everyone's like, oh, it's so great you're here and we're so supportive of what you're doing. But then when she actually starts putting out challenges to real policy mm -hmm. where real work has to take place, where the suffering of, of the people in power. And then there's a, you know, an element of work, I guess that could be affiliated with suffering when it really has to take place. She's now perceived as a threat. She's now asked to like, not put out so much, you know, kind of pace herself. Like she's asked to be less authentic and less genuine. Um, and so going back to that policing. So we say the question and asked you like what no, sorry well i think i think they wanted to know what the term for that and i think you're right it is still reinforcing patriarchy right it's reinforcing that idea that women need to accept the situations that they're in no matter how toxic it is in the name of kindness and 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 forgiveness and all of that so and i think we we do see that too within a personal context too right in our personal relationships too um in that women are enforced by other women to especially even to, to uphold their marriage commitments and everything at the expense of their own happiness. Um, so I think that's actually an excellent um, answer. Um, Matthew, do you care to add anything to that? Otherwise, we can move on to the next question. No, Melissa did. Melissa did an excellent job. All I would do is say elements of what Melissa said that would apply to personal relationships. But I think everybody gets it. Okay, great. Um, I do, since we did talk about um, privilege a little bit, I do want to delve deeper in terms of, you know, I, I think you all have done a lot of work to understand both the power you do have as well as, and the privilege that you do have and the, and the ones that you don't have. So um, in what ways are, um, you know, d does being, let's say, a cis white male, right, allow you to have some power and privilege? And, and in what ways, do, for Melissa, um, in what ways do you as a cis white women, right, do you have power over other non, uh, other marginalized um, uh, communities? Matthew, you want to go first? You know, the way that, the way that, uh, this might sound like extremely sort of pathetic to a lot of people in this conversation, but the, the George Floyd incident and the Black Lives Matter movement in response to the George Floyd's death was the thing that took me like a, a step further than than I was like so to answer this question it's uh you know it's it's you deny that you have the power first of all right like I didn't think I had any any particular power or privilege and you know, the way you think about it I think as a white person in a racial context is that never ever like overtly try to harm somebody because they look different than me under any circumstances. And I thought, just in the way in my marriage, I thought because I'm nice and, and, I, and I love my wife that I was a good husband. I thought that made me like a good sort of like co-citizen, neighbor, potential friend, things like that. But like the work is learning how to see. And I've had this conversation with people recently because this comes up. I want to hang out with a lot of white people. And sometimes they have the audacity to talk about how they think some element of like the Black Lives Matter movement's bullshit. And one of my favorite conversations recently has been talking about how I've come to understand this idea of privilege. Mm. And for me, it was that my, my, my favorite thing was thinking about a father or a mother, a parent of a child who has darker skin than I do, mm -hmm. having to be afraid of their children like driving a car and getting pulled over by police and they have to think about that interaction on a level that never has has never occurred to me mm -hmm. right and it's like it's this comfortable blind spot of i don't have to worry about my white son so long as he says you know yes ma'am no sir and you know, obeys the law, I, I don't have to even kind of be afraid of some like violent thing happening to him. And there are millions of other parents who do simply because their skin's darker than mine. And when I like realized the privilege that comes with that, the comfort of like not having that, that burden of responsibility, that thing I gotta carry around all the time, it, it became super obvious to me super fast how that relates to like, our romantic relationships and emotional labor and invisible work and all of this stuff 
that I've been working on for years. And I realized I need to grow like my nuanced understanding of these ideas and extend it beyond just the at home romantic relationship, because these principles apply to people who love someone of the same gender who love um, or, or who have different skin color than I do, or who, you know, a different faith or live in a different country. You can apply these principles to virtually every group who lives outside of the, their like me group. And um, that was, that's, I don't know. It was just like a really important sort of realization in the last couple of years. And I, I don't know, I, I tend not to talk about it very much. I, I don't feel like it's my world and my business, but as a father, it is. And uh, I work hard to talk to my son about these ideas. And so one of the things I was trying to think of something that could capture this idea of privilege that, that feels very personal to me. And I would say one of the ones that sticks out to me is this habit that I've been working on uh, that shows to me uh, an example of privilege, which is interrupting others. So I believe that because I, because of how I was raised, because of what's communicated to me, my, you know, the ability to interrupt is, is it shows that you think that you um, should be able to interrupt, that you, you're, what you have to say is more important than others, mm -hmm. you know, what they're saying. And, and in general, what I have observed is those in power often also struggle with this habit of interruption, of cutting somebody off. And so that's one element of so many where I believe just how I was raised, um, what's communicated in the culture allows me to think that my, my voice matters more. And it's something that I continue to work on. Um, the other piece that, uh, it, like Matt's saying, what's instilled, right? So if something isn't working for me, I've been taught that, like I, it's it go again going with that that um, ability to interrupt. I think my voice matters, so it's important that I should be able to say, like, this is not working for me. Well, I've been I've been raised to believe that, of course, people are going to listen to me, and of course, the situation will change, right? Mm -hmm. um, the ability to have that confidence and embody it um, comes from having just had so much privilege and have that like really, uh, uh, nurtured. And, and I was reflecting on, um, what helps me see other groups. I stole this from Glennon Doyle when she was talking about empathy in her most recent book is the ability to have a, a level of imagination to really imagine what it would be like to be in that person's shoes. Mm -hmm. And that is something that, I actually, I would say I, 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 is a strength of mine. It is also why it makes it really difficult or makes it almost impossible for me to watch intense, anything, intense shows, intense movies, because I feel as if I'm that person experiencing that situation. And it's, it's emotionally draining. Um, but it's such a, when Glennon talked about that, it's such an important skill. If you can cultivate your imagination and imagine what would life be like to be in this person's shoes. And then also like I, I follow most, of, mo I'm not on social media a lot, but most of who I follow are people who um, have less power in this culture and they are uh, brave enough to share their, their view of the world. And I hope that using that I can bring their voice give their, their voice, you know, their, what's the word I'm looking for? Bring what they're saying to light by using, you know, my power and privilege to, to help bring their voice into the conversation. Um, the other piece that I think is really important for me and what has helped me with my, is I will, after a conversation, especially if I know that the person has, you know, intersectional identities that I do not share, I reflect like, how do I think that person experienced me in this conversation? Um, and sometimes I'm not that stoked about some of the things that came out that I didn't realize were coming out because it's because it, most of what we're talking about is unconscious. Most of these habits that cause harm from these people in privilege 
and power, mm -hmm. it's, it's so unconscious. It's not, it's not in their realm of thinking, right? It's just like woven into their, ex their habits and it's woven into their nervous system. It's learned, but it's definitely, um, it's, it's definitely unconscious. And the only way to change something, right, is to bring it to the conscious mind. And so for myself, I'll reflect and be like, oh, shit, like I just perpetuated that or I interrupted that person. So whether or not they know that I'm working on this habit doesn't really matter. They could experience that as a form of racism or as a form of um, sexism or, or, you know, whatever their, you know, their identities that they're that, that make up who they are. Um, and that's shitty. And if I have a relationship with the person, my goal, and I know my sister was on this call, she knows that I do this. I call the person and say, I fucked up. And this is how I feel like I messed up. Like, this is how I feel like I, I interrupted you or I discounted you or et cetera, et cetera. Great. And that to me is so that I can be in alignment with my values. So if we're talking about motivating others, it's helping them see what their values are and their actions and how those are out of alignment. Great. Okay. I, we're running out of time. We still have other questions. Thank you, Kim. This has been a really great uh, conversation. I want to ask one last question. Um, and this is a pre-submitted question and I'm going to kind of modify it a little bit because they're talking about this um, aspect of early on in, in relationships, but I think this also helps with the workplace as well. So early on in relationships or any type of interpersonal dynamic, should one hide one's weaknesses or shortcomings while working on them? Um, or should one fess up to disclose them with that new person? Because part of it is that usually, especially in a job interview, right? If you talk about your weaknesses and everything, it can kind of backfire on you because people seem to kind of want to think about you know, who looks the glossiest, right? So what do you have in terms of the advice of how someone could be honest about their shortcomings and be honest about entering into any type of relational dynamic there? Go ahead, Matthew. Okay. Um, no, I, I, I love this question. I love this question because I was probably still I'm like super worried about like what people think, I, you know, like insecurity issues, like a lot of people do. And, um, you know, that manifests on dates and it manifested in childhood and the teenage years when you want people to like you. So you hide, right, the scary stuff, the things that you perceive might be like a reason to be rejected. And I don't know. On the flip side of divorce, I, I abandon that. In my coaching work, I talk about how trust is above all things, like the the number one value I believe we need between two humans, if they're going to have a healthy relationship, I just think trust is the metric that correlates like most closely with like a successful relationship and dishonesty, even if it's mistruth by omission is not conducive to, to, to trust building. So I am a personally an advocate of like putting it out there and saying, here's like all the bad stuff about me. Like here's everything that I am and it's very real. And step one, I think is learning how to like forgive yourself for not being a perfect human being. Um, and I, I think that I understand how the math results of my upbringing resulted in me showing up the way that I did in my marriage. Mm -hmm. And it does not mean I'm not responsible. It doesn't, I'm absolutely responsible. And there's still elements of guilt and shame there, no doubt. But I, I, I truly see like how it happened. And I, to a certain extent, forgive myself as I extend to almost everybody that I work with in struggling relationships. These are almost universally not bad human beings. Um, it, these are blind spot things. And so anyway, I love to say, here's all this, you know, neurotic, unpleasant stuff about me. And uh, you may end up getting you know, nine out of 10 people to not want to be in, you know, your intimacy inner circle, but the people that remain when they know you and not just you, the mask you wear when you're trying to get everybody to like you, those are the people with staying power that you can have a lifelong relationship with, whether that's intimate or whether it's a good friend or whether it's this like amazing professional relationship. And so I, I don't know what your guys take on that particular in the workplace would be, but I am a very strong advocate of courageously saying, 
here are all of the things that aren't so great about me. Um, but step one, I think, is learning how to accept it within yourself before you can even have the courage to say it out loud to someone. Mm -hmm. it, I would, I'm not sure I could add much to what Matthew's saying. Is the same of like, and evaluating, you know, if, if you have the power to, 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 be full, be able to fully show up. Is it psychologically safe? I want to keep coming back to that. And like, if you're at a job interview, um, you know, I, I think often I've had clients uh, that have been immigrants and they're on work visas and that limits often mm -hmm. their options. And so sometimes a lot of time, not even sometimes, but a lot of times I feel like they end up in these environments that are pretty toxic um, because that's just the relationship the contract itself makes it unequal, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. often give um, these folks much freedom. And so in those kind of situations, it's like, well, you might have to, like I was saying, the armor mask, you might have to because the the needs you have for that job are more pressing than your ability to fully show up as yourself um, and be authentic, right? Because it might not be safe or, or it might not make financial sense. That said, um, I would agree with Matthew and, and, and will, I think Brene Brown's research has demonstrated people appreciate other people's vulnerability. They may not want to do it themselves, but in general, they have reported that when they see a, especially a leader, especially somebody in power, it's so powerful. It builds trust. It builds alignment. Um, and and people are, are, when we're talking about high turnover, they're, le they're much less likely to leave a job if they have that trust that Matthew is talking about, right? If, they feel, if they're if they like, my leader is vulnerable. That said, also as Brene Brown sa has said, if you've ever shared, you've probably overshared. There are sometimes situations where bosses embody more too much of the feminine leadership and they, they overshare. They say things that really shouldn't, uh, employees shouldn't be carrying the responsibility of that mm -hmm. vulnerability. So it's a, it's a delicate line to toe and, and it requires experimentation. And a lot of times I tell my clients, try out these different ways of relating and trying to build connection and rupture and repair at work where there's less emotional risk, because in your intimate partnership, it can feel overwhelming. Um, especially if you're the less relational person, but you can, you can kind of dabble in areas where it's the same skills, but there's less of a, a risk to your mental and emotional health. Because like what Matthew has said, um, and there's research to back this, your happiness is, and your health is directly linked to the health and wellness of your relationships. That said, if they're not going great and you're trying out some new skills, it, that can feel really overwhelming. There might be backlash, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas you try it out in these lesser, you know, not as close relationships, there's less risk there. Great. Okay. I think that's all we have in terms of time for questions. Um, I want to leave with this kind of hard truth. So um, I, I want to close the session, but again, we will open it up with general questions. Do you guys still have another 10, 15 minutes? It's been such a, like I've had so many questions and so I just want to make sure people have time. Um, okay. Uh, I want to leave with this kind of question. And so I'm going to preface it with one uh, way this, that I learned OCHEM was actually I could boil things down to very super simple things, like things that the general population would understand. So like opposites attract, right? Like negative things move towards positive things. Um, and I want to pose to both of you, um, what is a hard truth, but a very basic one about power dynamics that you feel you've had to learn? Melissa, you want to go first? Well, I saw Matthew unclicking. You go, you go, Matthew. <laughs> okay. This is one of those things where we're at a four-way intersection. You go, you go. No, you go. No, you go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think I shared this early on in the conversation. I'd say the the folks that need to learn this these skills the most are the hardest to reach, really. And that's because in order to uphold these systems, in order to uphold the patriarchy, white supremacy, ableism, et cetera, et cetera, you have to have those empowered, not be able to see 
what's really happening, to not really see the matrix, right? Mm. I love that the matrix was written um, by two trans siblings, right? Like talk about a, a population that is greatly impacted by the bullshit that is patriarchy. <laughs> so not that I'm biased, but um, so, you know, and they're talking about like, you know, people being asleep and waking them up to the truth. And, and, and then once you see the matrix, you can't unsee it. And that's how I, for me, I, that metaphor really resonates with what we're talking about. Um, and it's, you know, the patriarch, patriarchy has the most to lose by having those in power see the matrix. Mm. Which is probably why the power of denial is so strong. And that's why they're really hard to reach. Great. Thank exactly. you. Matthew, on to you. Well, and I, I think about it much the same way. My, and, and, and right. I'm, as like straight white guy, I have benefited unknowingly, frankly, for much of my life from being straight white guy um, in the United States. And that the hard truth is is just to echo in a less articulate way the thing that Melissa just said, which is I, I had to be shaken out of that reality. I had to be knocked out of it, out of that that norm. Um, and, and I thought of like one more example that I almost wish I'd said earlier when I was talking about like racial dynamics is one of my friends was female sitting in a room of all male like upper management um in a meeting to discuss something in like the hr realm <clears throat> and she didn't appreciate the way that these guys were sort of approaching the issue uh, i believe very specifically it was a conversation about um blm merch versus make america great again merch and what we're going to allow in the workplace um and you know she relayed this to me afterwards and the way she reached the guys in the room and it really, really resonated with me was she looked around at all of them and she said, have you guys ever been afraid when you were on an elevator? Have you ever been afraid that when the elevator stopped in a parking garage, in a building, in a hotel, when the elevator doors open, do you ever have any like anxiety or fear about what might be waiting on the other side? And to a man, every one of them said, no, of course not. And she said, well, I've never not as like a single female adult, if I'm alone, I've never not been afraid when the elevator doors open because of some unimaginable things that I think have happened to her. Um, and that imagining and talking about like Melissa said about this, having this imagination where you can picture it, that really helped me see what would it be like to be in an elevator and every time like you're nervous about who might be or what might be waiting for you on the other side. Now, these aren't irrational fears. I mean, right, we're talking about we're talking about a, a, a situation where women experience, let's just say it, sexual assault and things of that nature at mm -hmm. a rate that the vast, vast, vast majority of guys have never had to even consider before. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, it's, it's that type of story and, and like relational experience where someone says, here's this like awful thing that I've experienced. And anyway, it worked by the way, her sharing that story did the thing she needed it to do to arrive at this sort of important empathetic conclusion on how the company was going to like face the staff and then and, and handle policy. And similarly in my own life, I want to be the kind of person that learns how to eliminate these blind spots. The most valuable lesson in that conversation is how I want to show up in an elevator mm -hmm. with a woman I don't know. And I've no, she might be the most comfortable person on earth, or she might be terrified of me. And I just want to be mindful of the possibility that life experiences have taught her to be like nervous about being trapped in that box with me. And so I try to behave accordingly. And I just think that's the work, but it takes the hard truth is that it takes us, I think, hurting the way other people hurt, suffering the way other people suffer in order to learn how to value that idea. Great. Thank you. That was very fantastic. Um, okay, I want to close this down. Um, let me send out a couple of links. Um, again, we want to, you know, hear your feedback from about the session from you. So I've got some links here to fill out the survey. Um, and then I'm going to open this up for another 15 to 20 minutes, um, if that's okay with the 
uh, with the guests over here to see if anybody has any questions. I'm going to stop the recording right now um, and sending out the links. So there's a donation for Melissa, resources there, um, as well as the uh, survey. And then again, if you want to continue to follow Women in Science Portland, um, please go to womeninsciencepdx.org events. Um, and I'm going to stop recording. And I think after that, we can definitely open it to Q&A. So feel free to use your mic, uh, turn on your camera if you want to. And Melissa and Matthew will be here for about the next 15 minutes or so. Oh, did the recording stop? Astrid I'm a, and crew, 